By the time you've finished your training, the airport will feel like your second home. Depending on where you train, this might be a small grass strip, a large complex in a big metropolitan area, or one of the thousands of airports in between. It could be an airport without an operating tower, where you are responsible for determining the active runway and following local procedures. Or it could be at a controlled airport. When a control tower is operational, air traffic controllers will instruct you to follow certain procedures depending on whether you're in the air or on the ground. To operate at a controlled airport, you must have two-way radio contact with ATC. Airports are the hub of all air operations. Not only is this where aircraft of various types take off and land, but this is also the place where aircraft are parked or hangared, and where you can rent, buy, or service aircraft. The larger airports can have several hundred operations per day. The logistics of moving this many aircraft over and around each other requires precise instructions and procedures. To relieve some of the problems associated with having so many aircraft operating in a concentrated area, the FAA has established some standards and procedures to help pilots better orient themselves around an airport. One example of this standardization is airport signs. There are six types of airport signs which provide you with information while taxiing. These signs are mandatory instruction, location, direction, destination, information, and runway distance remaining. First, mandatory instruction signs are used to denote an entrance to a runway or critical area and to areas where aircraft are prohibited from entering. These signs have white lettering on a red background and usually indicate the holding position for these areas. There are two different types of location signs. The ones used to identify either a runway or taxiway have yellow lettering and a yellow border on a black background. Runway boundary and instrument landing system critical area boundary signs have black markings on a yellow background. Direction signs have the same black on yellow markings and contain arrows which indicate the direction of taxiways leading from an intersection. Destination signs indicate the general direction to remote locations such as runways, terminals, military areas, civil aviation areas, and fixed base operators. Signs advising you of nice to know items are referred to as information signs. The runway distance remaining signs provide valuable information during takeoff or landing. These signs have a white number on a black background and are located along the side of the runway. The number indicates the distance remaining in thousands of feet. Now let's look at another example of standardization, runway markings. The basic VFR markings found on a hard surfaced runway consist of white runway numbers and a center line. At each end of a runway is a set of numbers, painted so they appear upright to an approaching aircraft. These numbers represent the approximate magnetic direction of the runway, rounded to the nearest 10 degrees, with the last zero omitted. In other words, if you are landing in a no crosswind condition on runway 29, your magnetic heading would be approximately 290 degrees during final approach. When landing on the same runway, but from the opposite direction, your final approach heading would be 110 degrees magnetic. This numbering of the runway to correspond to its magnetic direction can help you determine the runway's orientation long before you actually see the numbers. When two runways are built parallel to each other, both will carry the same numerical designation. However, the left runway number will have an L, while the right runway will have an R. Where three parallel runways exist, the letter C is added to the center runway designation. 
In addition to the center line, some runways used for IFR operations have additional markings, such as threshold markers, which consist of two sets of four parallel bars. Some runways have displaced thresholds, meaning the end of the runway is not suitable for landing. This usually is because of obstructions near the approach end, or the marked portion of the runway is not strong enough for repeated landings. You can identify these portions of the runway by arrows painted down the center, pointing toward a large white line that represents the actual runway threshold. You cannot land in a displaced threshold area, but it can be used for taxiing, takeoff, and landing rollout. Stopways or blast pads are marked with a chevron pattern. These areas are not to be used for landing, takeoff, and taxiing. All taxiway markings are in yellow and provide guidance between the parking areas and the runway. A broad yellow dashed line painted across a taxiway indicates a hold position at intersecting taxiways. Runway holding position markings consist of four yellow lines, two solid and two dashed. The solid lines are always on the side where the aircraft is to hold. These holding lines may also be used on runways that intersect another runway. At airports with an operating control tower, a clearance is required before crossing these lines onto an active runway. If you receive a hold short instruction, you must repeat that instruction back to the tower or ground controller. Any runway or taxiway that is marked with an X on each end is closed to all operations. During periods of limited visibility or at night, many airports are lighted to make operations safer. The amount of lighting varies greatly depending on the size of the airport. Taxiways are outlined in blue lights or blue reflectors. Additional taxiway lighting may be used during periods of low visibility. For example, green taxiway centerline lights may be available at some airports. Yellow in-pavement clearance bar lights indicate the location of holding points at intersecting taxiways. They are designed to increase awareness of holding positions during periods of low visibility. Runway guard lights are elevated or in-pavement yellow flashing lights installed at runway holding positions. They indicate where a taxiway intersects a runway. Stop bar lights consist of a row of red in-pavement lights. They are designed to confirm an ATC clearance to enter or cross an active runway during periods of low visibility. Pilots should never cross an illuminated red stop bar. Runways are outlined by white lights. On runways used for instrument approaches, yellow lights are used as a visual caution zone on either the last 2,000 feet or half the runway length, whichever is less. Some larger airports have flush-mounted centerline lights as well. To mark the end of the runway, the portion of centerline lights between the last 3,000 and 1,000 feet are alternating red and white. The last 1,000 feet of lights are red. To mark the beginning of a runway, green lights are placed at the threshold. These same lights, when viewed from the opposite direction, will be red, indicating the end of the runway. Sometimes, white strobe lights accompany the threshold lights. Sequenced flashing lights can be seen on some instrument runways in the approach area along the extended center line. These lights can vary in intensity and are used to guide aircraft to the runway during instrument approaches. At some airports, you can turn the runway lights on or adjust their intensity by keying the microphone a specific number of times within a certain time period. At monitored or controlled airports, you can also have the approach and landing lights adjusted by asking the tower or flight service station to temporarily adjust the lighting for you. Another light you may see is the airport beacon. 
This beacon aids pilots in identifying the airport from several miles away and is operational from sunset to sunrise and in some cases during periods of IFR conditions. Civil airports for land planes display an alternating green and white flashing beacon. Beacons at military fields emit two white flashes alternating with a green flash. Lights located on obstructions, such as towers and tall buildings, can either be red or white, and sometimes may be flashing. These lights assist you in picking out obstacles that could be high enough to present a hazard. At some airports, visual glide slope indicators are installed to help pilots judge the proper descent to the runway. One type of system is the Visual Approach Slope Indicator Lights, or VASI. This system contains two separate bars of lights, which normally represent a three-degree glide slope. When you're above the glide path, both indicators will be white. When you're below the three-degree glide path, both will be red. When the lower or near bar of lights is indicating white and the second far bar is indicating red, your airplane is on the VASI glide path. Another type of glide slope information system is PAPI, or Precision Approach Path Indicator. Instead of comparing two bars of lights, as with the VASI system, you compare lights on the same bar. When you're above the glide path, all four lights will indicate white. As your aircraft descends and nears the glide path, the lights on the right will begin to turn red. As the aircraft intercepts the proper glide path, the two indicators on the right will show red, while the two on the left remain white. When three or more lights show red, you are beneath the glide path and are too low. Another common aid at airports is a wind indicator. Since wind is an important factor in determining takeoff and landing performance, airports use one or more basic wind indicators. The most common type of wind indicator is the wind sock, which consists of a tube with one end bigger than the other. Wind blowing through the larger end causes the smaller end to streamline downwind. A more elaborate type of wind indicator is the wind T, which will weather vane into the wind. It represents an airplane pointed in the direction of takeoff or landing. When a wind T is co-located with another wind indicator, it may be manually aligned with the runway to indicate the direction of landing. Another landing direction indicator is the tetrahedron. Like the wind T, it may swing freely in the wind or may be manually positioned. When determining the landing direction using a tetrahedron, remember the small end points into the wind. Also, if the wind is calm, the tetrahedron may not be aligned with a designated calm wind runway. In this situation, use extreme caution. When installed at uncontrolled airports, the wind and landing direction indicators are usually placed in the middle of a segmented circle. The segmented circle helps identify the location of the wind direction indicator and the extensions indicate the correct traffic pattern for each runway at the airport. Each year, hundreds of aircraft are destroyed or damaged by collisions with other aircraft or vehicles on the ground. The majority of these accidents are preventable. All pilots must be more vigilant and become aware of the dangers of runway incursions. Ground operations during low visibility and bad weather can challenge situational awareness. When operating at an airport, always be aware of other aircraft and vehicles moving around you. Also, be aware of situations that increase the likelihood of an incursion. A runway incursion can involve an aircraft, vehicle, person, or object on the ground that creates a collision hazard. A misunderstood clearance can also result in a runway incursion or a potential collision. There are several procedures that you can follow and precautions that you can take to avoid a runway incursion. Complete as many checklist items as possible before taxiing. Concentrate on your primary responsibilities. 
do not become absorbed in other tasks or conversation while the aircraft is moving. Cessna 62740, hold short runway 17 right, landing traffic. Cessna 740, holding short runway 17 right for landing traffic. Read back all clearances involving active runway crossing, hold short, and taxi into position and hold instructions. If you are unsure of your position, ask for assistance. Controlled airports can offer progressive taxi instructions. Cessna 53549er, request progressive taxi instructions. Cessna 549er, proceed to the general aviation ramp via Alpha. Caution, construction on ramp near right. Report deteriorating or confusing airport markings, signs, and lighting to the airport operator or FAA officials. Also report confusing or erroneous airport diagrams and instructions. At busier airports, where there is an increased amount of aircraft, air traffic controllers must make use of the existing airport surface to keep traffic flowing at a maximum efficiency level. Land and hold short operations, also known as La Hasso, are used to help air traffic controllers work with more aircraft at one time allowing a more efficient use of the runway environment. Warrior 83312, you are cleared to land runway 26, hold short of runway 35. Specific knowledge-based training must be completed before any pilot can conduct La Hasso. In addition, student pilots conducting solo operations are not authorized to participate in land and hold short operations. The regulations state that pilots shall become familiar with all available information concerning their flight, including runway lengths and takeoff and landing distance for the conditions at the airport of intended use. Warrior 312, cleared to land runway 26, hold short runway 35. Acceptance of land and hold short instructions indicates that you fully understand the clearance, including all related procedures. Cessna 52241, clear to land runway 35. Hold short Bravo intersection for crossing traffic. Cessna 241, unable to hold short at Bravo. The pilot in command has the final authority to accept or decline any land and hold short clearance. The safety and operation of the aircraft remain the responsibility of the pilot. As we have seen, airports play an important role in aviation. In this section, we covered the major items of interest to a VFR pilot. However, each airport has its own unique characteristics. Further sections will introduce you to publications which you can use to better acquaint yourself with unfamiliar airports.